Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. Hope your another day is going good. Everything's going well with you. I was going to go over this video by Joe Patterson, who goes by the screen name Wisdom from Above, and it's a video that he uploaded called Unconditional Love of God. Now, in this video, and I've already watched it all the way through, in this video, what he says is that God's love is not unconditional for the believer. In fact, it is conditional. That God's love is conditional. That's the point of his video. So I thought I would break this video down and line it up with Scripture, all Scripture God breathed, profitable for correction, rebuke, and training in righteousness. So we're going to line up what Joe says to Scripture and see if it rings true. I did speed up the speed of the video. You won't be able to tell it, but I did speed it up just for the purposes of going along a little faster. So I'm going to go ahead and get right into this video. Hi guys, my name's Joe Patterson. Let me thank you so much for stopping by my YouTube channel. I'm going to talk about the unconditional love. <clears throat> and I think all I'm really trying to do here is challenge you to consider what is taught by the Holy Spirit over what you have been trained and programmed to believe. So a coined phrase would be, well, God's love's unconditional. So I don't, when we say that, we try to humanize God. We try to think, well, you know, if I had a kid that went bad, well, I'd still love it. I'd hate what it's doing, but I'd still love it, you know. And so you're, you're pretending like God's a human being, and he thinks with your carnality. But he says in his holy word that his thoughts are not like our thoughts. His ways are not like our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's thoughts higher than ours and his ways higher than ours. So what Joe is saying here is that it's a humanist thing for humans to love their children unconditionally, but God does not love his children unconditionally. His ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts, that he doesn't love his children unconditionally, even though Joe is saying that he loves his children unconditionally. Joe's actually, what he's saying by implication is that he loves his children in a more steadfast, enduring way, that he could love his children unconditionally with a humanistic love but God with his love loving people and he only loves people on a conditional level that his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts and he's using this in reference to God's love that scripture has nothing to do with God's love as far as the passage that he's referencing it's not talking about God's love he's just talking about God's love and then bringing up a passage and trying to relate it as though Hey, you know, I know you may love your children unconditionally, but his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. You know, like uh, making this misapplication of that verse. So I'm going to go ahead and get into this more. Let's look at what God says. And let's just forget what we've been programmed to believe. And let's receive the Holy Ghost on this, the spirit of truth. Go to Psalm 5, <clears throat> verse 5. <clears throat> And we will read a quick scripture, although there are many like it. Let's read it. Psalms 5, verse 5. Speaking of God, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence, says David, by this Holy Spirit. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men, the Lord abhors. <clears throat> now, to abhor something is a stronger word than hate. All right? So, let's look at some quick understandings. We all, if you've been touched by the Lord, then you can help to define the love of God. You can come into an understanding. So, what Joe is doing here is he's building a case that a believer is under the law. That's what he's trying. It's not a good case at all. He's just going to an Old Testament scripture and say, you know, there's verses, God hates all workers of iniquity. But if you're not under the law, you're not labeled a worker of iniquity. According to scripture, the law is a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ. Once you've been justified by faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. Sorry, I forgot to get out my little Bible. Uh, Galatians 3.24. The law is a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ. Once you've been justified by faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. So once you have a justified, not guilty verdict, you're no longer under the schoolmaster, which would reference that you're a worker of iniquity. So what he wants to do is nullify the gospel, which is that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. We maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And this is something that he's in complete and total denial of. I've done over 12 videos on him, and I'll put, it, again, the link in the description of this video. 
if anyone's not familiar with those videos that may have been listening to Joe, he's not being truthful with the gospel at all, and he's not being truthful with scripture or with the love of God as it's defined for his people in the scripture. So I'm going to go ahead and play some more of this. An understanding that you are no longer cursed children, but you've come into the love of God and entered into his body. Now you are blessed. Okay, so let's look at hate. Hate is a feeling, and this is this is your Google definitions. Sometimes they're okay, and some, but this is this is what the world calls hate. To feel intense or passionate dislike for someone, to detest. I detest that. Like most people detest the smell of a skunk. A skunk smells awful. You just, oh my gosh, it's a skunk. You detest it. Maybe the detest of the smell of manure, human human excrement, uh, poop. <laughs> you know, people detest it. Oh, it's awful. It's awful. You know, stink. I detest it. Okay. Uh, I think somewhere in scripture, the Lord talks about those who do wicked are a stench to him. They're not. Those who obey him are a pleasing aroma. Okay. See, when Joe says those who obey him are a pleasing aroma, he doesn't mean faith in the gospel, obeying the gospel. He means your personal obedience. He means your personal obedience that produces personal righteousness. That's a pleasing aroma to God. But we see in the scripture, it says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. That even our best attempts to try to become righteous end in catastrophic failure. And they stink before God. They are as filthy rags. So our righteousness comes through Christ and his obedience, just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. Romans 5, 19, that through the one man's obedience, Christ, the many are made righteous, not our own personal obedience. Joe is always appealing to his own personal obedience. He thinks this is a sweet smelling aroma to God, that that's what's pleasing to God. But the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God, the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, through which we have a justified, not guilty verdict independent from the law. We maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So what's pleasing to God is faith in God's Son and what Jesus Christ accomplished and who people are on the basis of that. But Joe keeps denying these things. And then reverting back to his flesh and his works and his own personal obedience and the denial of the cross and then saying this is pleasing to God, it is not. Denying what Jesus Christ has accomplished for his saints is is uh, not pleasing to God. So, I'm going to get back into this. It, let's, let's understand it. Intense hostility towards something or someone. Intense hostility. Now, what does our scriptures tell us by the Holy Spirit? Somewhere in scripture it says that those who love the world, the carnal mind, is hostile to God. And the things of God are hostile to the carnal mind, the way of man, the thinking of man. So the passage he's referencing is that the fleshly mind is hostile towards the things of God. It does not submit itself to the law of God, nor does it have the ability to do so. So when it comes to the flesh, it does not have the ability to keep the law. And I've said this over and over, that the law does not show our ability, it shows our inability. It does not show what we're able or capable to do, it shows what we're incapable to do. The fleshly mind is hostile towards the things of God. It does not submit itself to the law of God, nor does it have the ability to do so. And Joe is trying to give you this impression that people have the ability to keep the law when the Bible just shows universal guilt. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. That because of the law, uh, it just shows universal guilt, it just shows universal unrighteousness and he keeps appealing to his own personal obedience under it you know joe i wish you'd wake up to that fact that the bible is showing us very clearly in here that whatever the law says it says to those who are under the law that the whole world would become guilty before god and every mouth would be stopped that means you don't you cannot appeal to your own personal obedience and performance under the law i'm going to go over here to romans 3 by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For only through the law comes the knowledge of sin. No one will be justified due to their performance through the law, Joe. And that's the thing. You keep appealing to your performance to the law to be justified. But by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Only through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So a main part of the gospel is we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. 
a not guilty verdict independent from your performance and your obedience. Your the dog vomit that you keep appealing to, Joe, that's all it is. It's stinky vomit before God, and you keep appealing to it in the denial of the work of Jesus Christ and his cross. Let me go ahead and get back into this. To the carnal mind, the way of man, the thinking of man. The thinking of man is hostility toward God. Okay, that's scriptural. You can look it up if you'd like to. Different. And one of the reasons why it's hostile is because of the law, which the Bible says that he broke down the middle wall of hostility contained in ordinances and commandments. That Christ has broken down that wall of hostility contained in ordinances and commandments. And all Job does is raise it back up in people's mind. Raise up that wall of hostility when Christ broke it down. So I'm going to go ahead and get back into this. And you can see how angry... You know, I just got to pause here, and you can see how angry he he looks here, so get back into this. Different versions may say it a little different way, but that is scriptural by the Holy Spirit. So your humanism cannot please God. It cannot do it. Christ Jesus alone has taught us the way of love, the way to become a pleasing aroma to God. Satan will teach you how to become a stench to God, thus you will perish in the wrath of God. You will fall out of... The irony of this is because he doesn't want you to believe that your faith is pleasing to God ultimately. He wants you to think that it's about your personal obedience and your works. And so he is doing what the devil would want to, him to do, is preach a false gospel and deny the work of Jesus and your justification by faith. And again, I got a pause here. It looks like he's about ready to karate chop something. <laughs> he will fall out of his blessing into his curses. Children accursed, children hated by God. Folks, these are the facts, period. <clears throat> Where you get confused is you'll say, just like, well, God, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, and he loved us while we were yet in sin, Joe, while we were yet in sin. I I've heard all of this understanding. I'm not coming against the scriptures. I'm trying to correctly divide it to show you that nowhere from Genesis to Revelation is what I'm telling you going to disagree with what you're saying. It will. It will. Because you're going to give people the impression that no matter what, no matter how they live, they are still saved as saved can be when God says otherwise. Joe doesn't ever supply the verse that where God says otherwise. It's just Joe making the false charge that you can be separated from the love of God when we see Paul saying, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul goes over everything in creation, life, death, things present, things to come, height, depth, angels, principalities, powers. He names everything in creation and says nothing can separate you from the love of God. Now, Joe's message here is that you can be. Now, notice the stark contrast between Paul the Apostle's message that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Life or death, things present, things to come, height or depth of anything you go through, principalities or powers. And what Joe is saying is that you can be separated from the love of God. The very opposite message. And it's because of your sin, that's what that's what uh, Joe is teaching, is that your sin can separate you from God, not that Jesus separated our sin from us. As far as the east is to the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. And Joe is in complete denial of the work of, of Jesus Christ again, that according to Hebrews 10, 14, by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. So by one single offering, he has perfected us forever through the cross. So I'm get back into this. Because you're going to give people the impression that no matter what, no matter how they live, they are still saved as saved can be when God says otherwise. So what good is your carnal mind on this unconditional, well, no matter what I do, I know that God's mercy runs deeper than we can fathom. His patience cannot be rivaled by any man. See, he's trying to say, I know God's love runs deeper than I can fathom, but it runs out for Joe. Joe can fathom it running out and that it comes to its end, that Joe says, I can unconditionally love my kids, but that's a humanistic love, or God, you know, his love runs out. And Joe just thinks he can fathom God's love. Uh, you know, we see that verse that we just went over, how nothing can separate us from the love of God, how God unconditionally loves his children. Um, 
We see in the scripture it says that he would grant you according to his glorious riches to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the height, the depth, the length, the width, and to know the love of God which surpasses all knowledge, and that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So Paul the Apostle is saying that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. It's not because of our works or our performance or our obedience. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. So we're rooted and grounded in God's love. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the height, the depth, the length, the width. To know the love of God which surpasses all knowledge. To know the love of God which surpasses all knowledge, which Joe just thinks, you know, he can... Through his knowledge and his understanding, he can determine when God's love has run out for people. They've sought, they've sinned too much, you know, and he's just placing people under the law, which believers are not under the law. See, this is the thing. Joe's not consistent nor honest with the scripture here. The law is a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ. Once you've been justified by faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. Galatians 3.24, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10.4. Acts chapter 13, verse 39, through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things to which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. And Romans chapter 7, brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be joined to another, that is, him has been raised from the dead, in order that you might bear fruit to God. So over and over, we look in these passages, and we see that Christ is the end of the law. We're not under the law. We've died to the law, and the law has come to its end. Very clear in the scripture, something that Joe is completely denying. And then he wants to place you under the law, call you a worker of iniquity, and then say you're separated from the love of God. You know, and then deny the passages that clearly say that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So, go back into this. Many will perish because they choose the ways of the world. They fall in love with the world. They have other loves. They will perish. God, they will suffer his wrath. wrath his eternal wrath. Would not See, he keeps making... You think that if you're a believer, you're going to suffer God's wrath. He that believes in the Son of God hath the life. He that does not believe in the Son of God does not have the life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The one not believing in the Son of God, his life and his work, is the one the wrath of God is abiding on. The one believing that the wrath of God's not abiding on that person. It's very simple. Like a, a child can understand it. I could say, you see this passage? It says the one who believes has life. It says the one who does not believe does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Could you tell me the one that God is angry with? And they're going to say, the one that doesn't believe. Right, the wrath of God abides on the one that doesn't believe. So the one who doesn't believe will look to their works, their performance, their efforts. Lord, Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? And he will declare to them, depart from me, you practice iniquity, I never knew you. So I'm going to get back into this, but you can see what Joe is doing. He's just trying to place believers under the law, call them a worker of iniquity, and say that they're separated from the love of God. This is what the devil would do. This is the kind of stuff that the devil, and he does do it all the time. He does it through people like Joe. And I hope that eventually God grants Joe repentance and he comes to his senses and to the knowledge of the truth and he stops attacking the gospel and those that hold to the faith of Jesus Christ. His wrath. Wrath, his eternal wrath. Do you understand? Do you not believe in eternal? Many times people who believe in this unconditional love thing can't believe in hell, in eternal hell, tormented night and day eternally. They can't believe that. The Jehovah Witness uh, uh, spirit runs deep in people. Well, how could a loving God, you know, torment someone night and day forever and ever so it can't possibly mean that? They just rule that out, thus making God a liar. Scripture says otherwise. So God is merciful beyond what can be fathomed. No one will. He keeps saying God is merciful beyond what people can fathom. And what he means is, because in the context of this video, God's unconditional love, what he means is God loves people more than, than they can fathom. Yes, that's true, but not according to your definition, because God can stop loving people. His love is conditional. When you say God's love is conditional, then God's love is not more than you can fathom. You can understand that it comes to its end. It's, it's done. You know, it's, <laughs> so I mean, he's just totally misrepresenting, uh, you know, God's love for his people, for his children. Use. No one. 
the scripture says that God created evil for the day of the wicked. So you don't, you don't understand that. Okay, I'm not saying I understand it fully. Other, I surely do not. But you have no right to question God. If you want to know the meaning of things, go to God in humility. Go to God in your secret place. Cry out to God for understanding. And then be patient and wait on it. Wait on it. It may take some years, but... It may take some years. No, we can know right now from the scripture just by accepting it and understanding what it's saying that God's love is unconditional for us, that it surpasses all knowledge and wisdom and understanding, that we cannot be separated from the love of God. We see Jesus say, Father, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity and that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus says, Father, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. It's talking about those that are in Christ, those that are unified with them. He says that they may know that you have loved them even as you have loved me. That we're loved even as the Son is loved. The Son is loved by the Father with an undying, unchangeable, unseparable love. And we're loved that way according to the words of Jesus. That we're loved even as Jesus is loved. Can the Father stop loving Jesus? No. In the same way, the Father is not going to stop loving us. We are united to Christ, and we are loved even as the Son is loved. Father, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, and that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Those that are united with Christ are loved even as the Son is loved. Again, something that is an unfathomable love, but it's not the kind of love that Joe is representing Joe is saying it's a conditional love, that God's love can eventually run out. Well, that's ridiculous. That's not what the Bible teaches for God's children at all. So I'm going to go ahead and get back in there. But surely the Lord will answer. Then you'll understand. If you can grab some humility and some patience, and while you're waiting, don't stop serving God. Serve the Lord with the attitude of Christ, with meekness, with, with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, with a pure heart. Okay, while you're waiting. Hey, you can see that he fires out a lot of verses that he doesn't really deal with in context or tell you or explain them. He just imports his legalistic meaning like hunger and thirst after righteousness. Like Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So if you've come to Jesus, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes shall never thirst. So if you've come to Jesus, according to him, you shall never hunger and thirst after righteousness again. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, how are you filled? I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. The one who believes is filled with Christ's righteousness. Romans 3.22 even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. So we have God's righteousness. The only righteousness that truly exists is God's righteousness, and he bestows it upon all those who believe, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. So he throws out this verse, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, to make you think that you, you're going to be hungering and thirst, thirsting after it your entire life. That you can come and believe in Jesus, but you don't have it. You know, you got to still hunger and thirst for it. Jesus is saying, the one who comes to him is filled. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. They shall never hunger and thirst after righteousness. Again, they have been filled. They have the only source that could provide it, which is Christ. And that God made him who knew no sin. To become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we don't have to work to get that righteousness. And that's what Joe's teaching is that you have to work to become righteous. Romans 4, 5, to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So you don't have to work like Joe's telling you, you have to, you don't. To the one who doesn't work, but believes on him, Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, that's a non-guilty verdict. His faith is accredited to righteousness. See, Joe wants you to work to gain favor so that maybe if you work after a while and you're obedient, you're a pleasing aroma to God and you'll gain some favor. But Romans 4, 4 says to the one who works, it's not counted as favor, but his wages do. The one who's trying to work to gain favor, they don't get the favor they suppose. They're not pleasing God like they thought they would. 
they have now wages due. To the one who works, it's not counted as favor, but his wages due. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited or righteousness. You got to look that one up, Joe. That's in Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Okay, you might want to check that verse out. It seems like you've been missing that one. I pointed that one out over and over. You never addressed it, never mentioned it. Get back into the video. So let's go back to, to this understanding. Hey, disrespect, disgust, to, to, to be disgusted by something. We know that God is disgusted. He detests sinful behavior. He detests sexual immorality. He detests gossip. Those who, who are quick to go to someone's house and slander and sit around and talk about him and judge him, he detests it. He hates it. And if you become that, you're no longer under that love that you call unconditional. You're no longer what you think is, you're thinking I'm saying that you can never repent once you've done that. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is you must not become that. If you become that, you will not repent. And therefore, people will tell you, well, you know, you can't, nothing, you know, can separate you from the love of God, you know, but you can separate you from the love of God. You don't want to believe that. So you see a mocking Paul the Apostle when Paul said there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And then he goes, but you can separate you from the love of God. And Paul doesn't say that. Did Paul say that in the text? No, this is an additive that's brought on by his own humanistic thinking, that you can separate yourself from the love of God. It's saying that there's nothing in lie. And that would include myself and you, because we're in this life. There's nothing in life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth. So not things to come, nor things present, can separate us from the love of God. It's, it's mentioning everything in the entirety of creation, including ourselves. It says there's nothing in creation that can separate us from the love of God. And I'm a created thing, and you're a created thing. So this is Joe, again, trying to negate what the scripture is actually teaching. He doesn't want you to know the love of God. He doesn't want you to know that it surpasses all knowledge and wisdom and understanding, that we could actually attain to it fully and fathom it. He he thinks he can. He say, He's calling it unfathomable, but then he says it can come to an end. Well, that's not an unfathomable love. It's ridiculous. It's, a, yeah, it's just another false definition of his. God's love is something that we cannot be separated from, according to Scripture. It's very clear that Paul went through everything in creation to tell us that there is nothing that could separate us from God's love. And here we go with Joe, again, telling us that we can separate ourselves from God's love. It's ridiculous. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one will snatch them out of his hand. I and my Father are one. So Jesus is saying that he gives us eternal life, and we shall never perish, and we are in his hand, which is a symbolic reference to the power and might of God, the strength of God. And to say that you can jump out of God's hand is what these people always say. It's like imagining the father standing on the, at the Grand Canyon with the child and the child, you know, he wants to jump out of the, the father's hand and the father realizes it. And well, if the, if the child wants it, go ahead, jump off the canyon. You know, if we saw that in real life, we would not say that was a loving father. We'd go up and say, why did you let that young child, why did you let that child of yours jump off the cliff? And if the father said, well, I, I wanted him to have his free will. You know, I wanted him to have his own choices, so I let him jump off the cliff. We would not call that a loving father. And so Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And, you know, the proper translation understanding is that no man will snatch uh, out of his hand. That includes ourselves, and that's something that he's in complete total denial of. Also, the fact that eternal life means eternal it doesn't mean temporal. I give them eternal life, not temporal life. And these people always, and this is where it starts, really, where they deny the definition of what eternal life actually means, a life that goes on forever and never stops. And you get it the moment that you believe. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. Not might have, not could have, not possibly have, but has everlasting life. John 647, Joe, it's another one. Don't know if you ever checked that one out. But uh, the one who believes has, not might have, not could have, but has everlasting life. 
And so these things are right to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Another one in 1 John, not sure if you're familiar with that one. But you can know, not thank or hope or wish it's a possibility, but you can know that you have eternal life. And it's based on the perfect life of Christ and his unconditional love for the saints. So let me go ahead and get back into this. You don't want to believe that these these are the, you, Paul writes things that are hard to understand. Ignorant and unstable people distort what he says, like they do the other scripture. This is why you can't understand. Again, the the irony of this, and when Joe does this kind of stuff, makes these kind of statements, you know, that they twist and contort the rest of the scripture. That's all that Joe ever does with the scripture people to return to him lest they perish. he's bringing wrath upon them to correct them bring them away and those people that repent will be covered again by his love but those who do not fall under his wrath and hatred his he abhors them the children of pride god says he abhors worse than hates so you you cannot you don't understand so he's trying to call you a children of pride you know, he's just trying to put you under the law as a believer. And this is why, as a believer, you have to know the functionality of the law, or these people will try to deceive you. It's very easy to demolish their arguments. We demolish all arguments and every speculation that raises itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive and make it obedient to the word of Christ. But you have to know how the law functions. You have to know that we've died to it. It's come to its end. We're no longer under it, and we're free from it. And we have a justified, not guilty verdict in relation to our faith independent from the law. So we were never justified by the law to begin with, and nor is there any maintaining of justification towards the law. We maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is what God says. This is the word of God. This is what people like Joe will deny. Very clear scriptures. We won't deal with it. We're just gonna deny it. <laughs> Back in Satan has not offered repentance. Satan has made his choice. He is an enemy to God. He is an enemy to us. Though he is a defeated foe, he has he's not a rival to God. God has assigned him to something he's doing. He is in a hurry. He knows his time is short. So he calls the devil a defeated foe, but not for us, because the devil can still tempt us into sin. We can sin and go off into life of sin, lose our salvation, and not be saved. So to say that the devil is a defeated foe, it has no application for the believer at all, according to him, because we can fall into a life of sin due to temptations of the devil and lose our salvation and and the love of God for us. So, you know, to say that the devil has been overcome doesn't make any sense in his position. Now, it does for us who believe the scripture and that Christ has destroyed the works of the devil. And it says, I write to you, little children, because you have overcome the wicked one, past tense, that we have overcome the devil. And due to Christ, we overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. And something that Joe just does not want to acknowledge. This time is short. Before what? Before God's wrath is fulfilled in him. Where he is under the eternal punishment night and day forever and ever. And those children of the devil will go where he is in eternal punishment. So we have to get to where we can believe God over what we've been taught. Here's what the definition of love is, according to Google. <laughs> Great interest and pleasure in something. Well, I think we can read the word of God and see that God has a great interest in his people and takes pleasure in the children of obedience. This is scriptural by the Holy Ghost. He is, if you read in the book of Hebrews, what does God say about those who would turn back, those who would go back to their old way of life? What does God say? There now remains no sacrifice for them. They can't crucify the Lord of glory all over again. So, so this is what I say, too, about his reckless handling of Scripture. Like, he just quotes out a verse, and he thinks this proves his theology. He's not even dealing with context or even explaining it from his system what it fully means, other than if you willfully sin, there's no longer a sacrifice. But in that context, it's the Jewish Hebrews who, in Hebrews 10.10, 10, it says, By his will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So that's what it says in Hebrews 10.10. 10. Then in Hebrews 10.14, it says, By one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. So that's Hebrews 10.14. So when it gets down to Hebrews 10.26, 
They have been given the knowledge of the truth that the sacrifice of Christ makes us holy and perfect. But if you deny that and you go back to temple sacrifices, because that's the context, Jews going back to the temple, doing these shadows and archetypes of the blood of bulls and goats that could never take away sin. And he's saying, look, these are shadows and archetypes. And if you deny uh, the pinnacle of revelation, which is Christ and his blood, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, that that's what makes us holy, that's what makes us perfect, and you go back to these continual sacrifices, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for you. Jewish Hebrews going back to temple and old temple sacrifices and counting the blood of Jesus Christ as a common thing. If we willfully sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of a fiery judgment that will devour the adversaries. The adversaries of the cross that deny its application, that it's made us perfect, holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. It says that you have insulted the spirit of grace and trampled the blood of God underfoot. Insulting the spirit of grace is going back to your works. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself, but as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So to insult the spirit of grace, you just go back to your works. If it's of grace, it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So when these people have received the knowledge of the truth about the cross and its application, then you deny it. You deny that it makes us holy without blemish and free from accusation and perfect in the sight of God forever and go back to your works. Then there's no sacrifice for you but a fearful expectation of a fiery judgment. And that's why people that hold to works righteous doctrine and don't accept the sufficiency of the blood of Christ have a fearful expectation of a fiery judgment. That's what they expect, because they don't think the cross has taken care of their sin. And that's the kind of mental conceptualization that Joe wants to put people under, under this me mental conceptualization that Christ and his cross doesn't take care of your sin. He has received the knowledge of the truth. I've given him to him over and over. I showed him what the cross has accomplished, and he denies it. He denies what the cross has accomplished, and he goes back to his works. Well, for people with that mentality, there's no sacrifice for them. They're denying, even in their own system, they're denying the sacrifice. They're saying it's not there to take away future sin. It's not there to take away all your sin. Well, then they're denying the sacrifice. And now, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, if you willfully sin and you deny the sacrifice, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of a fiery judgment. So I'm going to get back into this fall under his wrath. So you say, well, he still loves them. <laughs> okay. If, if, you know what I mean? If you insist on it so much, I guess go right ahead. You know, go right ahead. While you're eternally punishing something, you still love them. I still love you. I can just keep punishing you and all that. I mean, that's just not what the Holy Spirit says in the scripture. See, because of his free will perspective, he doesn't understand that God foreloves people, individuals, before they even born. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, the twins not having been born, not having done any good or any evil, that God's purpose according to his choice would stand. So it's not of him who works, but of him who calls. It's said that the older shall serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. So before people are even born, God loves individuals before they're even born. And he has a calling upon those people. He chooses people for salvation. Something that, you know, uh, it's, it's clearly taught in Scripture. A lot of people don't like it, but Joe's not going to like it either. He's not going to like the idea that God for loves individuals. That in love, he predestined us to adoption according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. That before we were even born, God loved us perfectly with an everlasting perfect love. Spirit says in the scriptures that God abhors them. He abhors. So I don't, we want to believe, well, it's a love hate, Joe. I mean, you, know, you, you can car humanize it however you want, but you're, you're judging through your carnality. God is greater than us. The Lord can handle. The reason we have to love our enemies, this is an under. God is greater than us, but our love for our children is greater than God's love for his children. That's, <laughs> that's Joe's message. God is greater than us. But I love my kids unconditionally. God doesn't. Understanding, I believe the Holy Spirit is giving me. I, let me share this with you as a consideration. Consider this, that God has called us to love our enemies and bless those who curse us. Where God can hate his enemies. How come? 
Now that's the law. The law is summed up to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments according to Jesus. And according to the word of God, we have died to the law, we've been freed from the law, we're not under the law, and the law has come to its end. So again, Joe is trying to place you under the law to make you think that in order to please God, you have to love your neighbor as you love yourself, which is the law. And the law is not a faith. And Paul said, through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. So to live for God, you actually have to die to the law. You cannot look to the law and think that you're getting some kind of life out of it. The law is administration of death. And so we get life by faith in Christ. And so that's the thing. You know, he's denying that. Uh, see, it says right here. Through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. You look that one up, Joe. That through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. So to live for God, we actually have to die to our own personal obedience, our own human effort, our own behavior towards the law. And to live for God, we have to look at Jesus Christ as the object of our faith and believe what he did for us. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life. I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So that's how we live, by faith in the Son of God, not by, our, by the law but by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us, knowing that he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So that's how we live, by faith in the Son of God who actually accomplished something, Joe, something that you want to deny, that you want us to deny. We're not going to deny it, Joe. We're not going to be unbelievers. Here's the problem. Our anger doesn't do the righteous work of God. It never has, it never will. We must not become angered. When we do, we err. So God has called us to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to not return wrong for wrong, to not retaliate. When someone does evil against you, do not resist an evil person. But see, God can manage it. God can be angry and still please the righteousness in himself. God is God. He is able to handle all of it. He can make people for the day of evil, and, and, and he can make people for his glory. So we have to, all I know is how we must work our salvation out in fear and trembling. A lot of it seems like just desperate ramblings where he's kind of all over the place. You know, he doesn't know where to go with it, but he knows he wants to bring the people under condemnation. Know that we fall in love with God as we see who he really is and then he shows us who we are a new creation and we become like him in love in peace in joy in thanksgiving and praise and, and gentleness and kindness and patience and love and hope and endurance and self uh, and all these qualities that Joe's talking about in his system they're forced qualities that you have to produce to try to show God that you're really thankful, that you're really happy and joyful, and you really have peace. And it's all based on your own performance to the law where all this stuff is dependent upon. It's not actually dependent upon Christ and his work. It's In Joe's system, it has to be dependent upon your obedience and your performance. That's the ultimate catalyst for your peace and joy and everything. Because if, if obviously your performance or your obedience drops out, you, know, you better not have any peace or joy because you're a worker of iniquity who, who have lost the love of God, according to Joe. So it's just, he doesn't know that peace comes through the justified verdict. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, having been justified by faith, non-guilty verdict, we have peace toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says about that peace, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That we don't have to let our hearts be troubled, nor let them be afraid. That we have an eternal, everlasting peace. Not as the world gives, does he give to us. And it's through the justified, not guilty verdict. Therefore, I have been justified by faith. We have peace toward God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a justified, not guilty verdict. And through the knowledge of this, we have peace. Not as the world gives, does he give to us. So don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. Especially with false teachers. They can't um, substantiate their... There are false teachings like, you know, God's love will run out for you. That, notice how it hasn't demonstrated any of this from Scripture. It's just his railings against God and his love.
discipline and self-control and, and, and perseverance, you know, long-suffering. All of these things, we become like him. We are children of obedience, not lawless people, rebellious people who hate God. God so he keeps saying we're children of obedience, but again, he means personal obedience and effort and works of the law. This is what he means because he keeps saying love your neighbor as you love yourself, and this is your obedience. And yet, when we see Paul talking to the Galatians, he says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth through whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed as crucified? This one thing I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the keeping of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, do you think you're made perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So he who supplies the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the keeping of law or by believing what you heard? So Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So we see here that people that are bewitched are people that go back to the law to think that they're being made righteous and it's not through faith in Christ. The bewitched people are the people who deny what Jesus Christ has crucified and they're not obeying the truth. O oh, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you that you should not obey the truth through whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed as crucified. When Jesus Christ was crucified, it accomplished something. That God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's why it says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And same with all of us. That we have even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe. And there is no difference. The people that don't believe that are bewitched. They're bewitched in believing that their law, performance, and obedience and behavior can actually make them righteous before God. And they're not obeying the truth. They're not obeying the gospel. So, Joe will always talk about how, you know, as you as a believer, if you're just having faith, you're not being obedient. But that is the one who is being obedient. The one who's not working, but believing on him who justifies the ungodly. That's the obedient one, according to scripture. That you obey that form of doctrine. That you obey from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. That with the heart one believes to righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So with the heart one believes, we don't have to work to it. It's not about our obedience. This guy is so craven with his own personal obedience. And he's going to be one of those people, again, if he's not granted repentance. But haven't I done many wonderful works in your name? You know, boy, he's going to really hate God then. Like he says, oh, you got to love God. You're going to love God. Well, when the veil is finally pulled back, we're going to see how much Joe Patterson really hates the God of the Bible as revealed. You're going to see he's going to be one of the most God-hating people you've ever seen. He's had so much invested in his works. You owe me. Look at all his works I've done. My obedience. I, I taught people. You know, I just, Joe, wake up. By grace, you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. So you can never say it's of yourself, but it's of your works. And I apologize if I yelled and it was hard on someone's ears. I can imagine if you had headphones in, that might have been difficult. Sorry. So get back into this. God, the scripture would call them God haters. They're God haters. These are people who are not going to repent. These are people who do not even want to repent. Their consciences have been seared, thus falling under the wrath of God and the hate. See, he wants you to think that you haven't repented, but if you've come to your senses and to the knowledge of the truth of what the sufficiency of the cross has provided, then you have repentance. Correct opponents with gentleness, if God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses. So repentance is defined as coming to your senses and to the knowledge of the truth about what the cross has provided. So let me get back into this. Hatred of God. We are warned to let nothing deceive us. We are warned, Jesus said, to always pray and never give up. Jesus comes to, what, five churches out of seven in the in the revelations. You can see he's in all out panic now. But Jesus told us to pray. We got to be obedient. <laughs> you know, it's like he's, he's gasping for breath, trying to, you know, put you under condemnation. And he's just desperate. Like, desperate. It's like a, watching a person drowning here, trying to stay afloat. To warn them about something he has against them. There's something you're doing I detest. There's something you're doing I hate. You must repent of it lest I come out against you. He's loving them. And like he's not really specifically giving any chapter or verse. And he's talking in, in Revelation to several churches, which is a 
a body of believers, not a particular individuals. And so I don't know which verse he's referencing and which church he's talking about because there's uh, several churches mentioned that John references, but, you know, just... It's such a quick drive-by with this, you just don't know what the heck he's talking about. By warning them, but when they choose their way over God's, they become hostile to God. They become enemies of God. Anyway, if you can hear it, these are the pure enough facts. They're nowhere in Scripture taught the way the world is trying to... These are the pure enough facts, and he's not giving you any facts at all. He's just lying to you about, about God's love for the people that he has loved. It's just so clear. He's denying these clear things about God's love in Scripture. The apostate churches about God's unconditional love. Because I asked them, what does it mean? What are you saying? What are you trying to say when you say that? Are you trying to give people hope? Well, no matter what you've done, God still loves you. And, and I agree, if you are his and you stumble and struggle, we all stumble in many ways, all of us. I've watched thing, pornography before, went long after I thought I'd never do it again and said I wouldn't and did again. I know that God can forgive you. I'm not, I'm not against that. I'm not saying anything about that. I'm so this is where Joe gives himself a free pass, basically says, yeah, I thought, I would never watch pornography again after you you know a long time of not watching it, and then I watched it again and then I slipped up but he goes well if you continue on you have a lifestyle that's really what he's saying he gives himself a free pass under the law that well if you have an infraction or two it's okay if you have habitual ongoing sins under the law then you're in big trouble well that's just placing someone under the law and again Joe will never deal with the fact that believers are not under the law you are not under law, but under grace. So I'm going to go ahead and get back into this. And, you know, I know I'm going close to an hour, way longer than I intended to. I'm going to keep it playing for speed's sake. And seeing the glory of God and how good he is, then you go back to the world and act as though the world is greater than God, that it is better. You loved it more. You lusted after the flesh pots of the world of Egypt again. You told God, I don't want you. I don't want, I want to have fun. I want to live without this constant conviction. I get tired of feeling so condemned all the time because you refuse to repent. So here he goes, I'm tired of the constant conviction. And I know he means that the Holy Spirit is convicting the believer. That's what he means. And though the Bible doesn't teach that at all. And he's saying, you no, know, as a believer, you might be getting tired of that constant conviction. What you should be convicted of is your righteousness and that you're justified through faith in Jesus Christ, not of your sin, because the Bible doesn't say that the Holy Spirit is convicting the believer of sin. When Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He will convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I ascend to my Father, and of judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So Jesus says that he will convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me. Now, do you believe in Christ? Well, then you shouldn't be convicted of your sin. You should be convicted of righteousness. He says, I convict of righteousness because I ascend to my Father. And that has to do with us who are united with Christ. It says, if you've been raised with Christ, keep your mind where Christ is seated on things above and not on things of this earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, appears, we shall appear with him in glory. So we have died, and our life is hidden with Christ in God, and we are supposed to keep our minds on things above, where we re recognize that he is our righteousness, of righteousness because I ascend to my Father. And this was the work of Christ on behalf of those that believe. And he's denying it again, and he's saying that, you know, the Holy Spirit should be convicting you of your sin. Well, that would be in direct contradiction to the righteousness that we have by faith. So, again, Joe doesn't really carefully consider these scriptures. He just throws them out there to try to attack and abuse people with his false gospel and misrepresenting scripture and God and salvation. So you love to go places where they teach unconditional love so you can remain a wicked sinner and believe in the end. But the Bible is teaching God's unconditional love. By this love is perfected with us, that we may have confidence on the day of judgment, that as he is, so we are in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears has not been made perfect in love.
So we see again that we have nothing to fear when it comes to God's love. It is stable, it's forever, it's everlasting, it will not stop, it will not cease, we cannot be separated from it, it surpasses all knowledge. So we can see that there's no reason to fear, there's no fear in love at all. So there's no fear of losing God's love, and this is what he wants you to believe, that you should be afraid that you'll lose God's love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears has not been made perfect in love. Notice that this love gives us confidence on the day of judgment, by this love has been perfected with us, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, that as he is, so we are in this world, that as he is, so we are in this world, that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is the thing, is he's in denial of the work of Jesus Christ, that as Christ is, so we are in this world. He reconciled us to himself, to Jesus Christ's body, by his death, that we might be holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. And by this, love is perfected with us. God has perfected his love and demonstrating it through the cross and making us holy without blemish and free from accusation and the righteousness of God, so that we don't have to fear punishment over sin. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. For what? For sin. And the one who fears has not been made perfect in love. So the one who's fearing punishment over sin on the day of judgment has not been made perfect in the knowledge of God's love. And that's exactly what Joe wants to keep people from, the fullness of God, being filled with the knowledge of God's love for them, so that it would cast out all fear. He wants people to actually just be afraid that you will still be saved. That's the unconditional love that most people are wanting. Well, we are warned constantly to not let anyone deceive us, lest we drift away, lest we fall away. Paul says, lest I lose, lest you lose your secure position. Paul would say, lest I become disqualified. Disqualified. Through what? Through uh, disqualified in terms of the ministry and other people's eyes. That's why he said, I become all things to all people that I might win some. That is, he didn't offend people when he went into different cultures. To the Jew, he became a Jew. To the barbarian, he became a barbarian. That he would not offend those people and become disqualified in their eyes. This doesn't have to do with salvation. He's actually teaching that Paul was running around doing all he did under fear. He'd lose his salvation. Look, I'm doing this, guys, so I don't lose, so I don't get disqualified. I'm doing this so, uh, so I, I get saved. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is the type of mentality that he's trying to sow in people. And it's, it's totally false. You know, like, as though Paul was running around trying to earn and work for his salvation because he was afraid he'd be disqualified. Protection, and I want to have a gun in case someone breaks in my house. I'll be able to shoot him. I have every right, God, to, to defend myself. And all of these things you take back. See, again, Joe believes that if you defend yourself with a gun in your house, you're committing a sin. That if somebody comes in, doesn't matter if they have a gun or a knife, a hammer or a baseball bat, if you take out your gun and you shoot that person that broke in your house, you are a murderer. <laughs> You're a murderer under the law. On the untruths of Satan. Instead of letting your mind become transformed where you can become a true sons of God. Anyway, that's the understanding that I have received. I understand, so I don't go around talking about well, unconditional love because I know it's a worldly thing. It's a, it's flavored, filled with this not having to. So there you go, folks. He says God's unconditional love is a worldly thing. No, it's a love that is out of this world. That God would love us so unconditionally in the way He does. That He loves us in such a way that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And not only that, we're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. That we're more than conquer, conquerors, we're more than victorious, something that he's in complete denial of for the saints. And I hope that you do come to realize that if you're a saint, that you are more than a conqueror to him that loved us, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, nothing in life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so I hope this blessed someone and anyone that's maybe new to the channel. If you check out some of the older videos, you'll find a lot of passages that I deal with that these people misabuse. And so I hope that you'll be blessed here if you 
come to hang out. So anyways, God bless you. Peace to you guys. Take care. Gonna be